You can now find all of C-SPAN's nonfiction-focused podcasts in one place, the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed. Follow now, and you'll get all of C-SPAN's podcasts that are nonfiction book-related every week. I'm Shannon. And I'm Rachel. And as part of the podcast team here at C-SPAN, we wanted to make it easy for our nonfiction book lovers to access all of our offerings in one place. Hear from authors like Kadada Williams on her book, I Saw Death Coming, Joan Biscubic and her latest, Nine Black Robes, or Neil King, who shared his walking journey from D.C. to New York City in his book, American Ramble. Featured programs will include Book Notes Plus, Q&A, Afterwards, and About Books. You can follow the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed wherever you get your podcasts. Between 1810 and 1850, the Underground Railroad helped to guide 100,000 enslaved people to freedom. That's according to estimates from National Geographic magazine. I'm Shannon Rice, the podcast producer here, and this week, the Lectures in History podcast examines the Underground Railroad. Norfolk State University history professor Cassandra Newby-Alexander discusses the history of the Underground Railroad to help enslave people before the Civil War. Class starts after this. Hello, everyone. I'm Cassandra Newby-Alexander, and welcome to the History 335 online class entitled African American History to 1865. You all have been with me for the entire semester. I appreciate your support and, of course, your attention. Now, I have the honor to present one of my favorite topics. Today's lesson is on the Underground Railroad. And I have entitled this particular lesson, Escapes from Worthless Socks, Agency, Identity, and the Underground Railroad. Now, I'm going to tell you in just a minute what the word sot refers to. But before I do, I want to um, really kind of highlight um, what is the history of the Underground Railroad. Now, a lot of you have heard a lot of myths about the Underground Railroad. You've heard that uh, one of the myths is that people used uh, the quilts as a way of communicating information to people, hanging out certain quilts outside of their homes, and somehow people would pick up these messages about where to go to uh, uh, find routes of escape. Well, that's utter nonsense that the quilts never really existed in that way. Um, This was started by a person who was writing a series of children's books on uh, and, and trying to figure out a way to explain the Underground Railroad. But the reality of the Underground Railroad is so much more interesting, intriguing. And of course, one of the things that historians have learned is that the overwhelming majority of people escaped aboard ships. Why? Because it was quicker It was less dangerous in that you did not have to go through different uh, landscapes. You did not have to go onto different plantations or through a variety of different states. But the dangers were still there in terms of people finding you hiding aboard these ships. And that's why so many people who attempted to escape did not succeed. Here in Norfolk, in the Hampton Roads area, they had an inspection station that all the ships had to stop at. And that inspection station today is where we have the historic fort, Fort Wool, sitting in the middle of what we call the Hampton Roads, which is a body of water where all the rivers pour out into the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. And seven miles from the Chesapeake Bay is the Atlantic Ocean. And so they would stop at this inspection station and they would infuse nothing but toxic fumes into the holes of these ships, whether they were steamships or whether they were schooners, especially schooners, to to chase out people who were hiding aboard those ships. And they found a number of people trying to escape. But then in some incidences, uh, they did not find anybody and people successfully escaped. 
aboard ships, then you could have uh, not just individuals, not just men, younger men who were escaping, but often you would have entire family groups escaping through the Underground Railroad. You, the Another myth was that many people were escaping from the Deep South and heading all the way to the North, when the reality, and this is from recent scholarship, the reality is that many people escaped to Mexico. Um, or they escaped to one of the Caribbean islands. They were able to get aboard a ship and leave. Some escaped to the swamplands. And so if you were in Florida or Georgia, you would escape to the Everglades. Or if you were here in, in Virginia, especially the southern part of Virginia or eastern North Carolina, you escape to this enormous swamp called the Great Dismal Swamp. Today, the swamp is only about an eighth of the original size of the swamp. So it, it, it covered a massive amount of land. Uh, and a lot of people uh, who escaped, sometimes they were temporarily hiding in the swamp. Other times they went into the deepest part of the swamp uh, around what is called Lake Drummond. And there have been numerous uh, maroon communities uh, over the past 10 years that have been discovered. And so we want to, in this lecture, take a look at what was going on uh, uh, in America and how and why uh, this institution, this operation called the Underground Railroad emerged. But let's first take a look at that word sot. And it comes from an account that was recorded by one of the station masters on the Underground Railroad located in Philadelphia. And we love this man, William Still, because he was a serious pack rat. He kept all records. And he began to record in the early part of the 1850s the accounts of people who passed through his station. Why? Because one time when he was talking with one of the young men who was who had passed through a station, he found out that this young man who um, had escaped was actually his long lost brother who had been sold away from the family a few years before his parents, William Still's parents, escaped. And so he found out about this older brother, and that made him want to make sure that he recorded every single account in the hope that people, once slavery was over, that people would be able to reconnect with their family members. Well, this man, John Atkinson, told William Still that he had, he was a prisoner of hope under James Ray, who was his uh, master. And this James Ray was in Portsmouth, and he declared him to be a worthless sot, which is the same term for somebody who's despicable beyond measure, someone who is the lowest life of a human being. And, it, and William still said that John Atkinson said that, that his character was too disgusting for record. And, and then he went on to describe what John Atkinson looked like. He was considered to be a dark mulatto. So he was lighter skinned, but at the darker end. Uh, and a lot of people took a lot of time to describe African Americans uh, and their color. Uh, and you'll see this not only in the runaway slave ads that masters put out, but also in the recordings of these station masters as they were describing the people who passed through their station, in part because the names of people could be similar to others who escaped. So they wanted to create some identifying markers for these individuals. And he, and he also described how uh, John Atkinson had um, been hiring out his time, and he he was forced to pay his master $120 every year in exchange for his service uh, hiring out his time. And this was not unusual in port cities, which is why the Underground Railroad was so robust along the eastern seaboard and especially in the upper south. So we're talking about Virginia and Maryland, which is where the majority of people escaped. 
Um, and in this account, he also talked about how his master was drunken, how he actually worked at the Gosport Navy Shipyard in Portsmouth, which is now the Norfolk Naval Shipyard, and how he was forced to work for his drunken master uh, and how he had to pay this money out. And because he hired out his own time, that meant that he had a little extra spending change. And people who worked uh, by hiring out their time often would have some extra spending change, and that provided them with an opportunity to pay people to help them escape. And we know that a number of ships that uh, left these port areas like Norfolk, Alexandria, Loudoun County, uh, and of course the seat of Loudoun County, um, Wilmington, North Carolina, Wilmington, Delaware, all these places that were right there along the coastal areas and that had uh, important port areas, that all of those areas, you had ship captains, both steamers that would carry passengers as well as goods, as well as schooners that primarily carry goods back and forth. That is those captains or stewards or pilots, these were navigators, uh, they would pay them to secret them aboard the ship. And some of these individuals were part of a massive underground railroad network. So these networks operated in these localities, but then had one or two people who had contact, who maintained contact with those who were in the north. But let's talk a little bit about the origins of the Underground Railroad. So we know that the origins go back to the 18th century. Um, Individuals willing to help people escape, whether those individuals were where they lived, somewhere in the South or in the North, because slavery was legal everywhere. In fact, many people forget that. Uh, They forget that Crispus Attucks, who uh, was the first man to die in the... um, in the Boston Massacre was actually a runaway slave from New York. And because he was a runaway slave, um, he was, of course, living as a free person, working in the maritime industry up in Boston, but always susceptible to his master finding him and returning him to slavery. And so these individuals who were helping people escape were everywhere in the country, not just those in the North, not just those in the South, but everywhere in the country. But after the American Revolution, when America set forth the ideas of freedom, of liberty, of equality, that all men are created equal, and in the Declaration accused England of forcing slavery onto them, these ideals took root in a number of people's minds, and they believed that these ideals were how America should function. And because of that, you had the emerging group of what we call abolitionists, both black and white. Um, Some people also were propelled by a religious movement called the Great Awakening. And that movement inspired so many people to look at slavery and say, this is wrong. This is against God's rules and ordinances. The Holy Spirit tells me that holding a person as a slave is wrong, and therefore I can no longer be a slaveholder. And so you would see countless uh, uh, efforts to um, have manumission laws passed. And so we would see places like Virginia pass a manumission act. We would also see other places um, begin to get challenged, uh, like Massachusetts, um, uh, these individuals, and there was an enslaved woman who challenged Massachusetts Uh, and a slave system and actually won in court. So you would see this movement, this sort of abolitionist movement bubbling up uh, from the ground and coming up and changing the landscape of America. But one of the first accounts that we would see is something mentioned 
by George Washington, who was complaining in 1786 that a group of Quakers from Philadelphia were helping an enslaved person escape from Alexandria, Virginia. So there was tremendous concern because, of course, George Washington was a large slaveholder, and he wanted to maintain not only the system of slavery uh, in the country, but especially in his home state of Virginia, but he also wanted to protect the rights of slaveholders. We would see in that same year a man by the name of Isaac Hopper from Philadelphia who actually started creating a system uh, in Philadelphia and in other parts of uh, Pennsylvania that would lead to assisting. So a system that would assist people who had found their way to Philadelphia or some parts of Pennsylvania um, in, in their escape route and help them resettle, help them get clothes, help them get a job, or help them move to uh, another area further north that they thought uh, might be even more of a protected area for them. But within a few years, it wasn't just in Philadelphia, but this network began to spread out to other places, first among Quakers uh, as a system, uh, but also among free Black communities that were starting to emerge throughout the northern areas. And while there were free Black communities in the South, they could not openly organize uh, as the communities did in the north. So you would see communities, black, free black communities in Philadelphia, as well as in, uh, uh, New Jersey. You would also see it in New York. You would see it in Boston and eventually in places like New Bedford and Syracuse, New York. And these organizations, these networks of people would help individuals not only finding jobs, not only finding a place to live, uh, food, uh, clothing, because one of the first things you wanted to do was to change the clothes. You didn't want to have the person walking around in the same clothing uh, that they escaped in because that was an identifier. So so these, this network of people were very involved in also raising funds to help to assist, and of course, to resettle individuals so that they could continue to live their lives. Shortly thereafter, though, many of these individuals who escaped also wanted their family members to join them. In some cases, they escaped on their own. In other cases, uh, and this would be much later on, they escaped as family groups, but then they wanted all of their family members, both their immediate family members as well as their extended family members, to escape as well. It wouldn't be until 1831, though, that the term the Underground Railroad would be applied and be a coined phrase. Well, Blacks actually contributed, as I've indicated, far more to the Underground Railroad than had been reported by earlier historians. We had lots of historians writing about the Underground Railroad for 150 years, at least. But they left out African Americans until perhaps the last 30 or 40 years. And that's because the focus was on talking about the great work that many whites did and the sacrifices that they made. And that's not to say that they did not make tremendous sacrifices, because if you were captured um, uh, helping an individual escape, your sentence was usually prison or death. And especially if you were white, because you were seen as far more of a threat. For free black, your sentence was prison and or enslavement. And for a an enslaved person working on the Underground Railroad, your sentence was a beating and being sold to the lower south, which then for many people was like a death sentence. And so we would see African-Americans such as David Ruggles, who would rise 
to national prominence. In fact, he was actually called the father of the Underground Railroad uh, because he and William Still, so he was in New York, William Still was in Philadelphia. They were key components of this network in the North that helped to galvanize the community, the Black community, to provide homes, rooms, usually in their homes, as well as support, uh, creating this 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 network uh, in the northern areas to assist individuals escaping. Now, in the early years, the Underground Railroad was not a national network. We're not talking about a network that uh, officially extended to the south. Uh, what they did was they created a network in the north so that if people managed to make it to the north, then they would help them. Uh, they would resettle them. They would provide them with the necessities of life if they made it to the north. But they didn't have people going necessarily to the south to help people escape. And that's the difference between what would happen in the earlier years uh, from the 1830s and 40s or even before then and what would happen much later by the 1850s. Now, what would make people escape? Because escaping was a risky venture. You might not survive trying to escape. There were people long before Henry Box Brown who escaped from Richmond by having himself nailed in a small box and mailed to Philadelphia. There were a number of people who tried before him and failed. They made it to Philadelphia, but not alive because they suffocated in the box or the box was left on the docks for weeks and weeks. And they died either from asphyxiation or they died because it was too hot. Or maybe they had been turned upside down and they died because of the medical conditions of being on your head for days on end. And so what would propel somebody to escape? If you escaped and your family did not accompany you, they often paid the penalty. They paid the price. There were many accounts of men who escaped and they hoped to escape and then, and then managed to get their families out later. But while they, when they first left, their families, especially their wives, were usually brought in for interrogation and beaten. Some of them never survived those beatings. And so what would propel somebody to escape because the, the retribution was often harsh? Well, it had a lot to do with how they were being treated, this harsh treatment. And you will see account after account after account of how people said they could not take it anymore, that they were no longer willing to endure the hardships of their master's whims. And so it was the harsh treatment. Another um, uh, reason was separation from family. When Henry Brown escaped from Richmond, he escaped because he tried three times to purchase the freedom of his wife. His beloved wife was eventually sold from him, and he was heartbroken. Um, his, the money that he had raised to purchase her was stolen first by the owner, uh, and then by an attorney that he was trying to use as a liaison to help him. Um, in the end, she was sold away and he was so despondent that he even thought about killing himself. And then he had an aha moment that perhaps if he escaped himself, went to the north, he would be in a better position to try to find, find her. Of course, that did not work out for, for him. He never did find his beloved wife. But this, this idea that I'm separated from my family and if I escape, I might be able then to go to the north and retrieve them in some way was a key factor um, in why some people escaped. Other people were actually involved in the Underground Railroad. We know that a number of enslaved people, as well as free Blacks in the South, were conductors on the Underground Railroad or agents. Uh, In Norfolk, it was so interesting to me when I was doing some research, and I saw this um, 
this ordinance in the city uh, in which the city council ordered the station, excuse me, the postmaster not to deliver abolitionist newspapers to their population, to their population of enslaved people. And I thought, wait a minute, you mean (laughs) enslaved people could read? Uh, They had extra money. They actually had subscriptions to abolitionist newspapers. And you were delivering those newspapers to the enslaved population who were legally not supposed to be able to read and write. It just it really was a mind blowing thing for me. And so that really led me down a pathway to see how many people were actually enslaved and were acting as conductors or agents on the Underground Railroad. And so some of them who were about to be caught fled through uh, the Underground Railroad system that they used to help other people escape. Another reason was a desire for freedom and a better life. And of course, this we would see woven into many of the accounts. The people wanted a better life. They had heard about it. They read about it. They wanted to be free. They wanted to be free from the whims of somebody who was not willing to treat them well. And then finally, one of the key motivators was the death of a slaveholder, because that ultimately meant meant that you were probably going to be sold away or your family was going to be sold away. And usually when a slaveholder died, there were debts to be paid and people were sold away. And so this motivated a number of people to escape, but always with the idea that if they escaped, they would be able to be in a better position to get family members. Now, I wanted to show you this map because... This shows you the main area where a lot of Underground Railroad activity occurred, um, all going all the way up to um, the north because of the Chesapeake Bay and because of all of these major rivers that um, flowed into the Chesapeake Bay, which, of course, would flow into the Atlantic Ocean, and how these rivers and these creeks and, and of course, the Bay played a major role in helping people to escape from slavery because they were escaping aboard ships. Now, the ship sometimes would take them simply across the river. Like if you go into the um, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee area, going across the Ohio River to Ohio. Um, some, so you had to flee by land to a certain point, And then after that, you would f- uh, flee aboard ships. One of the, um, I think, significant parts of the film Harriet about Harriet Tubman, a film that was released a few years ago, showed that Harriet Tubman not only fled on foot, but she fled across water and she fled aboard ships that were operated by men, African-American men who were seamen aboard the ships and they called them blackjacks. Um, and these men were operating schooners primarily, traveling, uh, transporting goods from one point to the other. And that brings me to another point I wanted to mention, and that is the predominance of African-American men in the maritime industry. We know that many African-American men were oystermen, were fishermen, but they were also seamen. They worked aboard these ships helping to transport goods back and forth or loading them from the um, on and off the ships at the docks, um, men such as Crispus Attucks, but others were actually also uh, pilots as well as ship's captains, stewards, uh, working aboard both schooners and steamships, and some of them actually owned their own schooners. You also had African-American men who were ferrymen, because along the eastern seaboard, there were so many rivers and streams and creeks and so forth, that ferries were a constant necessity as people traveled back and forth. And so this map kind of gives you an idea of how important the waterways were. 
Now, historian Wilbur Siebert was the first one who really started giving us an idea of the Underground Railroad and these safe houses in the North. Of course, he focused primarily on the whites who operated safe houses. He only mentioned a few blacks in his account, and this helped to frame this narrative that the abolitionists and those working on the Underground Railroad were predominantly white because of his book um, uh, and because of the emphasis he put in the book. But he did include a number of accounts of African-Americans who were involved in the Underground Railroad, not just as passengers on the Underground Railroad, but as active workers on the Underground Railroad. But you had uh, one uh, recent book, um, and by recent, I have to put quotes around it. Uh, it came out in early about 2005, and that was Fergus Bordewich's book, Bound for Canaan, in which he tried for the, probably the first time to pull together a lot of these narratives from all over the country. Uh, and by all over the country, I'm not talking about past the Mississippi River, because that territory beyond from the Mississippi River to California was still dominated by Native peoples. And so the country really focus all of his attention on that territory from the Mississippi River to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and so he was looking at all these different operations, though he didn't really give a lot of attention to the maritime industry. He was still focused on a lot of these traditional accounts that uh, Wilbur Siebert focused on in his book uh, on the Underground Railroad. But it's still a, 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 an important attempt to look at the Underground Railroad much more broadly and to pull together some of these incredible accounts, both from blacks and whites who are working um, to help people escape. And in some cases, they themselves have been enslaved who managed to achieve freedom. Another book that was really an important account looking at the Underground Railroad, um, but from the perspective of why, of where so many people escaped and why they escaped was Fugitive's Gibraltar, written by Catherine Grover, in which she focused attention on New Bedford, Massachusetts, and how that particular city was so important in helping the Underground Railroad to thrive um, and why that particular city. And we find out through her book that so many of the abolitionists were actually the multimillionaires who operated the whaling industry and who themselves were abolitionists. And they created then an environment in that city that almost protected the fugitives. And that's perhaps why Frederick Douglass wanted when they were uh, recruiting uh, in 1863 for men who had served in the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. They heavily recruited in Boston, but especially in New Bedford. New Bedford that was considered a haven to protect so many people who escaped from the Underground Railroad. And the people who dominated in New Bedford were actually from Virginia. Um, and then, of course, we had Eric Foner's book, Gateway to Freedom, that was written, excuse me, published in 2015, that highlighted even more of the importance of some of these African-American networks, such as the one in New York, um, focusing attention on some of the lesser known people so that we, you know, he didn't continue to recreate or, or retell these stories about these abolitionists that we all knew about or these uh, workers on the Underground Railroad that we all knew about or the handful of people like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman who escaped. But rather, let's look at a lot of these other individuals and let's start talking about how they gained their freedom and the different routes that they took as well as including 
where they ended up. And after the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act was passed, many were encouraged to go to Canada, especially to the Ontario province, where you would see cities and towns created or filled with fugitive slaves, such as St. Catharines. That's where Harriet Tubman had a home, as well as Toronto, which was, of course, the capital of the Ontario area that later became even more important in the capital of Canada. Another book that that really kind of refocused a lens on um, uh, on on especially Pennsylvania and and Chester County, Pennsylvania, in particular. This is where Lincoln University was, and of course, Lincoln University was um, created to not only empower African Americans with a college education, encouraging them to be missionaries, but it also was a gathering place for abolitionists. Um, and Chester County in particular uh, was filled with free Blacks who created this important network along with uh, and partnering with the Quakers, uh, created this network of safe houses as well as communities that protected people who were uh, escaping through the Underground Railroad. Um, there was a church, a famous church, uh, that still exists is not is not open, but the building still exists called the Hosanna Church, and that's where a lot of prominent national abolitionists would periodically come, have meetings, as well as worship together in that particular church. The most recent book. Um, Timothy Walker's Sailing to Freedom that includes at least 10 articles looking at the importance of the maritime industry in the Underground Railroad and how that landscape uh, was an important reason why the Underground Railroad was um, perhaps most successful using sailing vessels. And so if you're interested in in the uh, historiography of looking at the Underground Railroad, these are the books to really pay attention to because they bring an important lens to uh, the Underground Railroad aside from the stereotypes that still keep populating our planet. Now, I want to shift very quickly, and I'm going to go through a few of these slides quickly, just giving you an idea of what helped to fuel the Underground Railroad, um, and and what you know, what were these? Why were these people so motivated? You know, why why were so many people uh, being sent to the South? Norfolk, for example, Norfolk, Virginia, uh, was uh, considered by William Still the Southern Depot of the Underground Railroad. That is that departure point going northward that more people con in a concentrated way in his mind escaped from Norfolk than any place else in the country. But interestingly, until the end of the 1840s, it was also Virginia's primary departure point going to the Lower South, specifically to Charleston and to uh, New Orleans, of the domestic slave trade. Why? Because of the robust maritime industry that was there. If you look at this slide, this is a 1790 census looking at the concentrations of enslaved people. And as you can see, all along the eastern seaboard, that's where the massive amounts of people lived. By 1830, you would see that it that the country had really expanded beyond the eastern seaboard, and you're starting to see what people call the black belt. These concentrations of African Americans in in the in the Carolinas, especially South Carolina, they were producing rice. So of course that required a lot of water access. Uh, but then, as you're going into the Lower South, including Florida. Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, as well as uh, uh, not quite East Texas. We're almost there. You would start to see 
African-Americans dominating those areas. Why? Because of the cotton production. And of course, that came about because of the invention and, and dissemination of the cotton gin. By 1860, you see clearly um, uh, the concentrations that form this black belt. And that's where the populations, both white and black, uh, not just the enslaved populations, they concentrated in those areas. That's where the majority of the um, cotton production was occurring. And by 1860, America produced seven eighths of the world's cotton production. Seven eighths. And, and yes, you had a decline in people who were owning slaves, but that doesn't mean that slavery was not important. You had a decline in those owning slaves, but those who owned slaves owned far more. In Virginia, you would still see about 50% of the population owning slaves you would see a significant difference in other states, such as Louisiana, South Carolina, where at most maybe 10% of the people own slaves. But those who own them, the 10 percenters, they owned the overwhelming majority. So what you're seeing is the beginnings of big business, of corporate America. In fact, um, many historians have said that the institution of slavery and the products that were produced were America's first big business, the first corporate business in America. And of course, the cotton exports really tells you this particular story. But what we know about the Underground Railroad is that most of the people were not successful in escaping from the Lower South, not unless they were in or could get to a port area. Now, I want to kind of shift a, a little bit and, and just mention a little bit about the abolitionists and especially the white abolitionists. I've talked a little bit about the black abolitionists. And I'll talk a little bit more, but for the white abolitionists, you will see the earliest ones were Quakers. And many of these individuals were motivated because of, because they were impacted by the Great Awakening. And they believed that just as accepting Christ in your life was a personal thing, they believed that so was your position on slavery. They thought, thought that it was wrong to own slaves, but they didn't feel that they should enforce that particular idea on other people. And so these pre-1830 abolitionists, white abolitionists, were not pushing to end slavery across the board, but rather to make it easier for people to free their slaves if they wanted to. And we would see a movement uh, in the latter part of the 18th, early 19th century to facilitate that. For example, Virginia in 1782 would pass a Manumission Act allowing individual slaveholders to simply petition the court saying who they were going to free, why they were going to free them, and when they were going to free them. And then they were freed. But by the early part of the 19th century, those same states that had passed manumission acts were pulling back on them and making it, <laughs> excuse me, more difficult to free their slaves and forcing those enslaved people who were recently freed to leave the state. In fact, Virginia had a law um, that said if you were recently freed after 1806, you had a year to get out of the state. And if you didn't, you would become a slave again. And so it then became a disincentive to free your slave. And especially if um, people wanted to be with their family members. We would see these uh, early white abolitionists tend to have a colonization outlook. Uh, they wanted blacks to leave. If they became free, leave the country, go back to Africa. Of course, the problem was uh, since so many African-Americans were mixed, not only mixed with different Europeans and different indigenous peoples, but they were also mixed with different African peoples. Exactly where in Africa would they go back if they even wanted to go back or if they wanted to go to Africa? Um, 
And, but they had a colonization outlook. They pushed for the creation of a colony that we call today Liberia. Um, and of course, they did not believe in immediate uncompensated emancipation. They believed that it should be gradual. It should be individual. And of course, if people free their, their enslaved, um, uh, people, then they should be compensated for the loss. <laughs> And we would see groups, these are just a few examples, like the Pennsylvania Abolition Society that was created in 1775 that aided free blacks in court, that drafted petitions to end slavery, that disseminated information about anti-slavery activities. We would see another one, New York Manumission Society, doing the same thing, helping blacks to be educated. So, Even though many of them were not, they were gradualists, they were moderates, they still provided some assistance to free blacks, but they were not at all interested in free blacks being a part of their organizations for the most part. And they wanted to maintain control of what would happen. Um, And you would see out of those organizations, the creation of the American Colonization Society. Uh, Eventually, many free blacks would reject the goals um, and appeal of the Colonization Society. And and they would um, uh, there would be almost a fight between many free black organizations and that and that society. You would also see people like David Walker, uh, who published Walker's Appeal, who is very much against colonization and was responding to their uh, position on colonization. Of course, uh, in his appeal, uh, he was talking to both whites and blacks and using the Declaration of Independence as well as the Constitution as his argument for why slavery should be over and why white people should not be pushing black people to leave America because it was just as much their country as it was white people's country. Then you had the post-1830 abolitionists. And the reason that 1830 was so important is because it's that period of time that we would start to see cotton production emerge as America's big business, its first big business. And so that shift in the economic importance of cotton production and the labor force that was needed to ensure that that production happened, that would also impact the voices of many of these abolitionists, especially the white abolitionists, but it would also change the fervency of many free blacks because they found themselves very vulnerable as well, not only in the South, but in the North. For example, in New York, by the 1830s, they had a kidnapping club in which they were kidnapping free blacks and selling them to the Deep South uh, as enslaved people. And so 1830s, that period what represented a, a, a sea change. <coughs> Excuse me. And how African Americans <laughs> it represented <laughs> it represented a sea change in how African Americans would. <clears throat> be seen in this country, (laughs) excuse me, having a moment here. All right, so what the 1830 abolitionist groups did was they pulled together and formed for the first time a national abolitionist organization. But they wanted to differentiate themselves from the earlier abolitionists. And they called themselves, instead of an abolitionist society, They took the name Anti-Slavery Society. And of course, words always matter. And they were distancing themselves, really, from the more moderate approach that earlier abolitionists had. And so the American Anti-Slavery Society was concentrated in Boston. 
and included Blacks as members. And here, you know, there were three leading Black abolitionists, James McCrummel, Robert Purvis, James Barbados, and they were advocating for immediate, uncompensated emancipation. The Abolitionist Society actually formed in Philadelphia. They brought together uh, 63 delegates from 11 states, and they really were the ones who said, we're going to directly confront slavery. We're not going to just sit back and help if somebody comes to the North. Instead, we're going to directly confront slavery, and we're going to start sending agents to the South to help undermine slavery. They believed in direct confrontation. In fact, this is what David Walker actually said in his book, that that those who were against slavery needed to directly confront it, not just to be passive uh, supporters of efforts to end slavery, but they needed to directly confront it. Now, eventually this organization would split because of the concerns, especially those who are pushing a more religious perspective of it, uh, but their concerns about this direct confrontation. And so William Lloyd Garrison and his supporters on one side and Arthur and Lewis Tappan, who were big industrialists in New York on the other side, who would actually eventually help to create the American Missionary Association. So these two sort of groups, they would split the organization apart, but the organization would continue to thrive under the leadership of William Lloyd Garrison, who would publish one of the most important newspapers, abolitionist newspapers in the country, The Liberator. And The Liberator was the one that um, had huge numbers of subscriptions that that um, included the voices of many people from throughout the South as well as the North that sent coded messages about what was going on, especially in terms of, of abolitionist activities or Underground Railroad activities. But there were other newspapers that were out there, and um, and many of them were actually being published by African Americans, such as Freedom's Journal, which was published by Samuel Cornish and John Brusworm. These were two black abolitionists. Um, You had uh, another one, the Colored American. In fact, black abolitionists didn't really just talk about ending slavery. They also talked about the rights of African Americans, the rights as citizens of this country. So they were advocating kind of a twofold approach, while white abolitionists were simply focused primarily on ending slavery, <clears throat> black abolitionists, most of whom were free blacks publishing these newspapers in the North or had moved to the North, they were focused on two things, ending slavery, but also the rights of free blacks. And you would have individuals who were well-known, such as Absalom Jones, who created the first Black Episcopal Church, who was among those early abolitionists, very intent on making sure that he and his congregation and his network were involved in helping. And so the idea of Black churches being very much involved really is embodied in the work of Absalom Jones, but this extended throughout the entire country. It wasn't just with the Black Episcopal Church, but it was with a lot of Baptist and Methodist churches. You would see, um, and I I wanted to show you pictures uh, of those individuals who were early Black abolitionists who formed the General Colored Association, advocating those two things that I just mentioned. Because again, it wasn't just about ending slavery. That was the first and, and important step. But the second step was also to promote the rights and privileges as citizens of this country of African-Americans. 
So, for example, um, you would see uh, in the Massachusetts branch of the General Colored Association pushing for abolishing all of Massachusetts discriminatory laws. In fact, what's interesting is when Frederick Douglass escaped, he complained about how when he was in Massachusetts and Boston, he could not get a job, even though he was a skilled caulker, a person who waterproofed the ships. But because of the Caulkers Association that barred Blacks from being members, he couldn't get a job. And so this organization was saying, well, look, you know, you can't just free people and then deprive them of a right to earn a living. You have to allow them to be full citizens and to have full access to everything in society. Another thing was integrating schools. Uh, these public schools, these, these were public dollars. And so there should not be a prohibition about blacks becoming part of these public schools and abolishing any prohibition to interracial marriages, as well as uplifting the community in many ways. And so here are a few pictures of some of the most prominent black abolitionists in the country. Of course, we have uh, Paul Cuffey, who was one of the earliest black millionaires who owned his own shipping line in New Bedford, or William Wells Brown, or Henry Highland Garnett, Charlotte Fortin Grimke, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, also known as E.W. Harper, whose most famous poem, Bury Me in a Free Land, was so powerful. In fact, I want to just recite the opening lines to that. She says, make me a grave where you will, in a lowly plain or lofty hill. Make it among earth's humblest graves, but not in a land where men are slaves. And so it is a powerful uh, poem. I I encourage you to uh, look it up and to read it yourself. Um, and it's these kinds of of poems, songs, uh, writings uh, that help to transform the way people thought about slavery. Solomon Northup, he was kidnapped into slavery in the late 1830s got his freedom um, after 12 years, um, uh, and it was a hard-fought battle uh, by the 1840s, and published his book called 12 Years a Slave to talk about the horrors of slavery and how free Blacks were being kidnapped into slavery and the business that the business side of slavery that was so, so devastating. Or Marianne Chad Carey, who uh, started the newspaper, The Provincial Freeman, that she published out of Toronto. Toronto in Canada, uh, which was an abolitionist newspaper, or Harriet Tubman, who managed to be something of everything. She was not only a fugitive slave, what I call a freedom seeker, but she was also someone who decided to be a conductor, a very effective conductor on the Underground Railroad. But she didn't stop there. During the Civil War, she was a nurse, a spy, and actually led troops into battle, helping to free the largest the single largest number of enslaved people ever, over 700 people she led to freedom. And so these abolitionists, these are just a few Black abolitionists I wanted you to know about and highlight, even though they're mentioned in your readings. And that leads me to talking very briefly about Harriet Tubman, lots of of myths about Harriet Tubman. In fact, you know, you you see pictures where there's a wanted ad uh, with her picture on it. Well, uh, aside from the people who knew her, uh, including her slaveholder, nobody else knew what she looked like, which is why she was so effective. And she was a master of disguise. Uh, she she managed to look like different people every time uh, she would go to the South, which was at least 19 times, to d- retrieve people, including her entire family, with the exception of her husband, her first husband, who was actually a free Black, who did not want to leave the land that 
that he owned and go to the north. Uh, we know that she suffered a traumatic head injury, which may have resulted in why she never uh, learned, was able to learn how to read and write, but she knew the landscape. She knew how to read the landscape. She knew how to read people and she knew how to read the stars. And she used especially the waterways in her quest to not only get her own freedom, but the freedom of hundreds of other people. But she always carried something with her to, re- to as a way of protection, but also to keep other people from uh, running back. She always carried a gun. And there were a few times when people thought they got frightened and they thought they were going to turn back. And she basically pulled out the gun and said, you're either going to be free or you're going to be dead because dead men tell no tales. And so essentially, you're not going to go running back and tell everybody and expose this network uh, to uh, those who seek to destroy it because you would endanger the lives of everybody who's a part of that. Here's um, uh, an ad. And in the middle of the ad, you see the, the name Minty because they call Harriet Tubman Minty. Uh, Aranita was her name. And it talks about how she was 27 years old. And of course, Minty ended up where? In the office of William Still in Philadelphia. And that's how she became uh, not only knowledgeable about the Underground Railroad, uh, she was directed to William Still when she arrived in Philadelphia, but she also became the most important conductor on the Underground Railroad. And of course, with his assistance, all the people she brought in, he managed to coordinate the effort to resettle them And of course, um, to make sure they had jobs, plenty uh, of food, clothing, as well as support um, as they um, resettled in the North. Now, I just wanted to kind of focus a little bit of attention on some very important statistics that I've been able to garner from William Still's account. There were other um, station masters who recorded um, uh, what happened, but they burned most of their records at the end of the Civil War. William still did not because his goal was to use his records to reunite all these individuals who had fled with their family members. And so he actually, during the Civil War, he actually hid all of his records in a cemetery in Philadelphia, especially when he thought that the city might be overrun by the Confederates. And in his book, he recorded over 763 accounts. And of that number, 285 came from Virginia. Now, keep in mind that he wasn't covering everybody who escaped, and he only started recording these accounts in 1851. So accounts before then, he did not record. And those accounts after uh, 1860, he did not record. And there were still freedom seekers throughout the Civil War and the months leading up to the Civil War. So there's a lot that he did not cover, but this kind of gives us insight. 350 out of those 763 accounts came from Maryland. Why? Because Maryland was contiguous to Pennsylvania. And that made it much easier for people to escape to that area. 42 came from Delaware. And then there were a few other states, uh, including Washington, D.C. And so I also mentioned, you know, for the city of Norfolk, 102 escaped from Norfolk. But those who escaped from Portsmouth and from Richmond actually passed through the Norfolk station. So some of them were recorded to have actually left aboard ships in Norfolk, even though they may have been from Richmond, uh, Petersburg, or Portsmouth. Um, And so these accounts were really important in helping us to understand. Now, I wanted to to also just show you this entry in uh, William Still's a journal where he talked about Harriet Tubman uh, and he talked about so many other people 
in this particular journal, what is called Journal C, which is truly important. And one thing I want to say about that is that he had a son who understood the value of what his father did. And instead of throwing his records away after his father died, he gave them to an archive to preserve. And that's why we know many of the stories today that we didn't know about before, because that archive kept that material and has now pulled it out for people to understand. And I, you know, just to quickly talk about Harriet Tubman again, you know, while she was operating, she became the Moses of her people because the slaveholders were so angry about her effectiveness that they, you know, they were publicizing a lot of the escapes that she was implicated in. Now, some of them she actually didn't do, but any escapes after a while, people thought, oh, it must be this this woman, you know, this Moses, what they call Moses, uh, who's helping people escape. Now, there were other people. There was a man by the name of John Fairfield, who was from the western part of Virginia, who was also a notorious conductor. This is a, a white man whose family uh, was a, slave, a prominent slaveholding family. And he was so angry about slavery that he managed to make sure that all the enslaved people on the plantations that were owned by his family members successfully escaped. And he used different disguises um, to uh, help these escapes. Um, we There's a reference to him dying uh, and being killed um, and they're saying uh, he was trying to foment a slave revolt, but probably he was captured trying to assist a number of people escaping from Virginia and going up to Canada. But he also was quite effective. And what helped, what propelled people up to Canada? It had to do with the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. Now, there were other Fugitive Slave Acts that had been passed uh, by Congress. And of course, the Constitution, the 1789 Constitution, had a fugitive slave uh, uh, clause. But the Fugitive Slave Act is what made it um, difficult. And let me go back to that slide. It made it difficult for people to remain in this country, primarily because a special court was created to um, that almost incentivized the magistrate to rule in favor of somebody being an escaped slave. And so abolitionists started pushing and recommending that people leave and go to Canada. What we know is that after the Civil War, or actually during the Civil War, some of these individuals came back to this country and enlisted in one of the United States colored troop regiments. Some of them would come back after the war um, and some of them actually returned to their hometowns uh, uh, while others went out west and settled. So we know that the Fugitive Slave Act resulted in so many people leaving the country, but the end of the Civil War brought so many back. Now, how did many of them escape? I mentioned, you know, schooners and I mentioned steamships. And I wanted to show you a few pictures of some of the most prominent steamships um, in, and especially steamships uh, that had uh, stewards or, or one of the seamen helping to, uh, to hide uh, a freedom seeker aboard the ships. And usually their special compartment was a little tiny uh, uh, access space, uh, often over the boiler. Uh, so it wasn't a pleasant ride uh, going from, uh, say, Norfolk or going from Richmond uh, or going from New Bern um, or Wilmington, North Carolina, or going from any of the other port areas in the South, uh, going to Philadelphia, Boston, New Bedford, or or uh, Syracuse, New York, or any of the other places. Um, but these individuals help freedom seekers aboard these ships. And they left in um, on regular time. So here from a Norfolk ad, 
you see the ships listed, you see the ship captains, and these um, vessels left on a regular basis. Um, and you can look at some of the accounts and see when they left. And you can see on these ads, oh, yeah, I see they left on this particular uh, date uh, uh, coming uh, up to uh, Philadelphia or any of the other locations. Some of them left on skiffs, like in this picture, uh, and the waterways that you see, you see how rough it is. This is the Hampton Roads, the body of water where all the rivers pour into this sort of massive water hub. Um, this is why the Hampton Roads was chosen as the access point to the largest naval base on the world in the world, the Norfolk Naval Shipyard. It's 300 feet deep, seven miles from the Atlantic Ocean at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. And these individuals were headed past that inspection station and they were going to get aboard a schooner that uh, had actually uh, passed the inspection and were headed to Philadelphia. So that's an example of how some of the people escaped as well. Or you had this wonderful uh, image. And if you come to Norfolk, Virginia, you'll see a plaque um, where this event actually occurred. You see uh, uh, Captain William Fountain, uh, and he's hammering at his ship because he has at least 20 people who have been secreted aboard that ship in a compartment. And the mayor and a bunch of thugs from Norfolk went aboard the ship to tear it up because they had heard there were enslaved people aboard the ship. And in his bravado, he said, oh, I'll help you find them if you think I have slaves hidden aboard. And he started chopping on the other side of the ship. Eventually, he was allowed to continue on the journey and all of the people made it uh, safely to the north. We would also, and I mentioned this earlier, we would see people hiding in places like the Dismal Swamp. Um, and everyone in the region knew that there were enslaved people uh, hidden in or hiding in the swamp. And a few were found, but the majority were not because the swamp was such a difficult place to penetrate um, between all of the insects, the biting flies, the mosquitoes, the chiggers, the ticks, the fleas. Aside from all that, you had the bears, you had um, a fox, you had snakes, you had all kinds, you know, wolves, you had all of this facing you as well as going through the sludge, the muck, and all of that. And that's why many people who lived in the deepest part, the heart of the swamp on these in these maroon communities often lived there generationally. And so here are a few pictures. Uh, there, the, there was one man uh, named uh, Strother Hunter, who was a reporter for Harper's Weekly, who decided to venture into the swamp. And he managed to find in some enslaved people uh, or formerly enslaved people like this man, Osamon, who was in his 60s. And clearly he had been uh, brought here from Africa uh, one of the West African countries. Um, he even had the markings from initiation ceremony on his cheeks. Uh, and very early in his life, he had escaped and he was one of the leaders of these maroon communities. And there were other accounts talking about people who lived in the swamp. Um, and many, of course, in the North, uh, you see in this picture, were helping people uh, who had escaped by boat sometimes uh, just coming across rivers or creeks uh, to um, put them in, in carts, wagons, uh, carriages, and taking them to safe spaces so that they could continue to live. Now, I want to also mention one last thing, and this is based on some recent discoveries. So this letter from John Atkinson that was published by William Still, this is a man who escaped from uh, a worthless sot uh, in Norfolk. So he moved to St. Catharines 
in Canada, in the Ontario province of Canada. And he made known that there were some people who helped him, like a Dr. Lundy. Now, these are people who are living in Norfolk. He also talked about Henry Louis. Now, his code name was Bluebeard, who was an enslaved man who also ended up escaping. Um, but he was a big conductor on the Underground Railroad in the Hampton Roads area. And he talked about these individuals helping. Well, a few years ago, there was a discovery about this particular church in Norfolk. It is the only Black basilica in the nation called St. Mary's. It was created uh, as a safe space for Haitian refugees, both white and black. It was created about in 1794. Uh, This church that currently exists um, was actually built in 1857, but there was a previous church, St. Patrick's Church, same congregation, that was built to to help provide support and safety for these Haitian refugees. Well, one of the people who was a member of the church was named Mary Olgavy, who later married a man named Levest, and she was a member of St. Patrick's Church. Well, her father was a Haitian refugee, and her mother was a free Black from Norfolk, and she lived in this area, and eventually, when she was uh, an adult, she purchased a little boy who was also a Haitian refugee. His name was Mark René de Morty, and she did not free him until he was almost 21 because of that law that required that all recently free people had to leave the state. So she held him until he was able to go back and forth to Boston. Um, And then so she emancipated him. And during this time, he actually, and this is a picture of de Morty in his later years, we find out because of a of a um an account that he published, he used to work for a Dr. Harry Lundy, the same one that was mentioned by John Atkinson. Um, and they were working to help people escape on the Underground Railroad. And then he picked up uh, Lundy's work and worked for four years uh, as a conductor on the Underground Railroad and keeping in touch with abolitionists, especially in Boston and in New Bedford. Um, There was a letter that was intercepted by slaveholders in Norfolk, by officials in Norfolk in 1851, and he had to flee because it implicated him uh, working. Well, one of the interesting things, not only is that his adopted mother, Mary Levest, um, helped to get the plans that were stolen for the USS Merrimack, which became the CSS Virginia, first um, uh, ironclad vessel. And of course, that sped up the construction of the USS Monitor, which was the first iron, first fully made ironclad vessel. Uh, not only that, but recently, in the last few years, they discovered a tunnel in the church, and it's the only tunnel that's been discovered in Hampton Roads. No explanation for the existence of this tunnel. Three feet wide, four feet deep, made of brick, constructed according to the forensics of the brick, constructed sometime in the early 1840s. When the church was burned down, and they believed by abolitionists, excuse me, not abolitionists, but anti, but, but pro-slavery people, um, the, the, the new church that was then renamed St. Mary's actually altered its architecture so as not to disturb the tunnel. And it was only when the church was renovating its sanctuary that they found this tunnel, and it actually had two parts to it. And the end of the tunnel uh, led to a wharf, and the tunnel actually went into uh, firmly into the Black community. So it's interesting that even today, we're finding out more information about uh, the Underground Railroad and its operations. That's how secretive it was, and that's how integrated into the community it was. I wanted to end with just showing you a few pictures. I've talked about William Still. I've talked about 
the abolitionist society that was there in Philadelphia. And he was the secretary of the vigilance committee of that abolitionist society. And this is a picture of where they operated. And of course, this is just a map showing you the location of Boston, New Bedford, always on the waterways, important port areas uh, that not only brought the ships in, but created um, an environment and communities that help to protect and support uh, the the uh, freedom seekers. And then finally, I wanted you to see in Ontario, these are some points uh, of where African Americans would settle. And of course, in some cases, uh, they would return back to this country after the Civil War in the hopes of finding uh, freedom finally here in America. And so I wanted just to conclude our discussion with hoping that you will take the time to read more about this incredible uh, subject on the Underground Railroad and hopefully share your this information with other people in your communities. Thank you all so much for attending this class, and I look forward to our next session. And thank you all so much for attending. Take care. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. Podcasts.